I think actors have two things. They, they go through the whole process of knowing the characters and feeling familiar with the places in the, in the, and events in the script. And they also get the experience of the people they're working with. with the plastic cup, very typical of the 1902 era. The Foibles are producing a movie. <laughs> we gotta get in and get out! Anna Green Gables is the story of a young orphan girl who is adopted by an elderly couple who are brother and sister, and of her experiences growing up in a fictional town of Avonlea, which is set in the eastern seaboard. It is a story of how this very precocious, very proud, very determined little girl ends up changing the lives of so many of the people in the community around her. And in Anna Green Gables, the sequel, she goes on to greater heights and greater achievements uh, by actually leaving the island on which she's living and going to a very sort of wealthy provincial town, teaching in a private girls' school, um, and once again changing the lives of the people who she meets through the course of her adventures. You shouldn't be wearing other than for reading. Shut up! Teacher, Miss Shirley. Miss Shirley, is it? <laughs> We've met before, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes, sir, I remember. Let's see, come on now. What the devil have you done, Miss Shirley? <laughs> okay, I'll I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, there are a lot of things that can very easily pull you out of the time period. Why is this truck coming? Keep painting. Come on. You can't have the, the noise of planes or the 401 or whatever freeway, you know, screaming behind you, and you just have to block them out. Yeah, I'll tell him that was no good. We've got a plane in. When you're doing the scene, and you, it may be all behind you, but what's in front of you is 50 crew members and the camera, and they are but the last thing that looks, period. So you, you just really have to block it out and have a pretty strong sense of what you think, what, you know, your feeling of the period is. And action! Well, we shall see about that. Huh? What is it, Miss Stacy? Kingsport is full of Pringles and half Pringles. They're the old money that rules this town. And Mrs. Tom, Pringle bosses the whole tribe. I was afraid they'd be down on you. Why should they be? I'm a total stranger. Cousin, it's Amy Pringle. Right. Well, I started acting professionally when I was nine. Um, I grew up in a, fam a household of actors. My parents, uh, Ted Follows and Don Greenhouse, were both theater performers as well as a director, my dad is. So I grew up in an environment where I was always uh, ar around and associated with the theater. My, there's four kids in my family. I'm the youngest. I'm now 19. And uh, three of us are actors, and one is a writer. So we all kind of took on the profession that we were uh, brought up around. My family support is, I mean, means a lot to me. And I, I, I don't think I would have gotten where I have today without the support I've had from them. And I brought my grandmother down to the set. Um, she's 86 now, and, or 87, actually. And she, um, she, I like to include my family in what I'm doing. It means a lot to me. Are they calling you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll be back. All right, sweetheart. Good luck. Thanks, Jeremy. Oh, I think Megan is a lot like Anne. She must be. I think that's why she, you know, she was, she was quite scared uh, creating the character of Anna Green Gables because everybody has a preconceived idea about Anne. And she just uh, did the best that she could and whatever it meant to her by reading the books. And it, uh, most people who have seen her just say, well, this is Anne. It's because a lot of, there's a lot of similarities between the two characters. Anne has a lot of different qualities. She goes from being um, extremely hot-headed, uh, very stubborn, very romantic, uh, and very uh, dreamy. She loves to just, she has a, her imagination almost always gets the better of her. 
Megan Follows is a consummate performer. Uh, she epitomizes the word professional in that she takes her job very seriously. She is constantly there as the character and in a technical sense as well. For example, she's able to uh, muster up an emotion at the drop of a hat. Okay, you go off to Anne's left. So go to your right. No, go to your right. Sorry. Okay, and that leaves them. And then Megan, you take a step forward, and Frank to take a step forward. Perfect. Let's get the flowers right. out of there and move the hearse back six. Okay. A little more. A little more. And it's it's at that point, um, Lionel, that once uh, John Viev, the little girl, has embraced. Pull the hearse out of the way, the group starts to disperse, all right? Can I step up for just a second? What I really need is concentration, and especially when it's demanding that you be uh, in a, experiencing a certain emotion, whether it's like the funeral scene in the sequel where you're crying. I, For me, I just need time to focus, because if I can get my concentration and I can focus my energy, then I, I can pretty much conjure up the feelings that I need to uh, from the scene. I could use that again. You can just bite it from the top. Okay. Lay it in, please, and turn over. And this is from? From Emily's Brace. Right. 361, take one. And action. Oh, I shall miss you, Emma. But we will see each other again soon. And I promise you, I won't ever forget you. Just you mind that. Well, goodbye, Miss Shirley. No one in the whole world like you. Cut. Thank you. Good. Checking the gate. Perfection. I had a lot of fun with the, the bedroom scene, where we're singing and making fools of ourselves. And uh, I like that scene, too, because it shows a sort of a closeness that girls had, uh, the friendship they can have. <gasps> the perfect bride. You look into Fred's red face and whisper, I do. <laughs> Don't be me. <laughs> the action of this scene calls for Anne and her best friend Diana to fall on the bed giggling and the bed to collapse. Because normal beds don't collapse at the, uh, the appropriate moment, we built this one so that it would. Pull the catch. Now just promise me one thing. If he faints, make sure you catch him. <laughs> It's rather a difficult job being producer, director, and writer of a major miniseries like this in that you're constantly at odds with yourself. In the morning, I'm a director. In the afternoon, I'm a producer when we're running out of time and everybody's scrambling to make sure that we've got the shots. And in between, of course, you're always dealing with the performers who want to make slight modifications to a line or whatever. So um, I think one has to train oneself just to become very focused on what it is that you're doing at that particular moment. Kevin Sullivan is... Um both of these pieces really are his baby in a sense. He knows them uh, inside and out. And he's really wonderful to work with because he also lets you put your input into it. I'd like, like him to be a... To no, no, I just, no, no, I, guess I, I agree. Unclear. No, if you're unclear, then, then we've got to change it. Because um, I can just yeah, show you okay, the observations that I had. Well, then let's do that. Because they were real subtle and do I thought... Do you want to do that when we go back? Yeah. Since we've got the afternoon? <laughs> Let's use it wisely. <laughs> yeah. Working with Colleen Dewhurst is a wonderful experience. She is, she is an amazing lady. You don't feel intimidated with her. I mean, be, because she is so wonderful and you know the reputation she has, that can be intimidating in a sense. But she just makes you feel so um, at home. And she's, they always say Colleen is down to earth, but she really just, there's no nonsense with her. And when she works, uh, she likes to have fun. So there's no kind of, uh, you don't feel inferior, she doesn't treat people badly at all. So she's just a really nice, great lady to work with. Marilla, 
Do you never wish you'd adopted a boy like you intended to? He could have run this farm, saved you all this trouble. And surely, I wouldn't trade you for a dozen boys. Now you just mind that. Was it a boy that got the Bachelor of Arts and won the Rowling's Reliable Story Contest? Now was it? I'll miss you. I'll miss my girl. I've been very pleased with all the performances that are, have been given. You get actors coming to this thing desperately wanting the roles. For instance, Rosemary Dunsmore, who's playing uh, the role of uh, Miss Brooke, the principal of the school where Anne teaches, came into the audition and said, I want this role. I want to play this woman. I know what she's like. I know women who are exactly like her. And you won't find a better actress than me. Well, the performances have been wonderful. Don't patronize me. This is not a public school of the kind that you are used to, Miss Shirley. Our students do not require embellishment. Simple, straightforward adherence to rules and regulations which I have clearly delineated for you, Miss Shirley. We were dealing with a lot of bad weather conditions and things like that, so we'd have to kind of, uh, especially Kevin would have to think of changing things at the last minute to accommodate uh, things that were beyond his control. Every cloud has a silver lining, as they say. <laughs> you're waiting for it? I'm waiting for it. Tell us what you're doing here. I'm uh, trying to make these aluminum windows look like they're painted white. For the simple reason that they didn't have aluminum windows. Never tape on them instead. Tape budget on this film is about $900. You can see why. And uh, could you tell us what you're doing? Uh, the leaves are covering up the asphalt so that we don't notice that this is actually a paved driveway. I think the most difficult thing one is shooting is the actual principal photography production. You're always under the gun in terms of uh, time and money, and the most horrible thing actually is not having the time at the end of the day or being up against weather or something like that where you can't get exactly what it is you want. It really has been a total rain out today, but they're promising splendid sunlight tomorrow, so I can only anticipate that, that the scene will be able to be shot in continuity since we have wonderful weather and wonderful autumn color for everything else. And uh, we'll start tomorrow and start from scratch, and everybody knows what they're doing now since we've had a chance to rehearse the buggies and the horses and the sheep, and we'll just start in the morning and keep on going. <laughs> We're going to confine the sheep to an area right close to the wagon that they're now housed in so they don't scatter all over the place. It's always difficult when you're dealing with sheep. Nothing usually goes right. It takes a, a lot of takes before you get what you want. <laughs> now, ladies, please bear in mind here that we're all, please, we're also recording uh, Dan Wendy's dialogue on the road. We'd like you to be as big as possible back here, but it's got to be all mine. Okay, so don't say anything. I don't care what the Pringles say. I think you're quite good looking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll be in the wagon push, uh, shooing them out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll just get in and, and get one out, and once one goes, I'll all go. with people in a very short amount of time. You've spent almost every waking hour of the day with these people. And uh, it's, it's sometimes very sad when you, I mean, it's like you experience a sense of loss when I finish something. Uh, and then you just, you sort of get it out of your system and you go on to the next. But 
And especially on a case like Anne, it stayed with you for a long time. I think that's why we all came back and did the sequel. I think, by and large, we're very fortunate, though, because somehow, I don't know, by whose grace it is, it always seems to work out, so I'm pleased.